Likuti Sicha is Chelek Tezayin, Volume 16, the fourth Sicha for Parshas Boy. In this Sicha, the Rebbe will explain the difference between the Matzah, which we use today exclusively in, for the fulfillment of the mitzvah of eating Matzah, namely Matzah, which is um, prepared exclusively from flour and water and nothing else, versus Matzah Ashira, Matzah, which has other, other additives in it, such as fruit juice, or oil, or wine, or milk, uh, and or as we know today, egg matzah, which is obviously not fit for the mitzvah. Um, the, the the basic difference between these two things is, a, is as follows. When you have flour and water exclusively, that has the potential of becoming chametz. However, that potential is suppressed by means of the quickness, the swiftness in which we knead the dough, roll it, and put it right into the oven. We don't give it a chance to become chametz. Matzah ashira, on the other hand, if it's made exclusively with fruit juice or eggs or, or milk and the like, then it really has no ability, no potential, halachically, to become chametz. Thus, it can never be kosher at all, and it can never be considered, quote, matzah. The matzah, which may have a chance to be considered matzah, Yet, it has the disadvantage, the fact that it is a matzah ashira, that it has those additives, is when it has a mixture of the additives, let's say the fruit juice, but it also has water in it or the like. Once you have water in it, the water acts as an agent which potentially could make it chametz. Also in the sikha, we're going to learn the difference between kabbalah's oil, that means the service of Hashem, by means of just total and absolute subservience and acceptance of Hashem's will, in, in the sense of Kabbalah soil, Kabbalah soil literally means to accept the yoke, just like an animal, a yoke is put onto the animal. It doesn't have a choice in the matter. It doesn't have any means of reasoning if it wants it or it doesn't want it. It does it. That's where the term Kabbalah soil comes from. Versus one serving Hashem, what's called al Tam Vadas, in accordance with their intellect and appreciation, meaning one does it willingly, the one does it with desire. You, we may, however, also look at it this way, a term that perhaps we're very familiar with, the difference between iskafya and ishapcha. Iskafya means to suppress one's desires. One has a desire to do something, but or not to do a mitzvah. And one, um, one employs the means of iskafya, which means they suppress, they bend their will, and then there's this hapcha, which means total transformation. Just one more thing before we begin the sicha, just to familiarize ourselves with the psukim, which speaks, which speak about the mitzvah of matzah. So let's go back all the way to the beginning in Parsha's boy. That's Chumash Shmoy's Parsha's boy. When you look into chapter 12, verse 8, it says over there about the korban Pesach, the ochlu sabasar balayla zeh, they should eat the flesh of this korban on this night, Sliesh, it should be roasted in a fire. Umatsois and matzois. It should eat that means I already had instruction to eat matzah. Amroy Mikhulat eat also together with bitter herbs. And then later in verse 18 it says, quote uh, speaking about the later Pesach, it says Barishan on the first day, in the evening, on the fourteenth of the month, in the evening, Toichlu Matsois, you should eat matzois. So already then the mitzvah of eating matzos was given. However, when we look in Chumash Devar, in Parshas Re'e, that's chapter 16, verse 3, over there when it discusses the rules of Pesach, it says, Shiva Siyomim Toichel Ol of Matzais Lechem Oini. Seven days you should eat Matzais, and the Torah adds Lechem Oini. Lechem Oini means literally a bread of affliction, a bread of impoverishment, and the Torah gives us a reason, gives us the caveat, Ki Vechipazoin, for in haste you have left Egypt. So just keep these two, these two different uh, references to the mitzvah of eating a matzah in mind. Let's get into the sicha. So the Rebbe says when it comes to the commandment of eating matzahs when the Jews were still in Egypt, it says that they have to eat matzahs. As we just quoted the Pasuk, they should eat this night matzahs. But we find something very astonishing, an interesting contrast. That in the matzah that we are commanded to eat in all future generations, that is in the matzah that we eat, the Torah says very clearly that you should eat matzah is lechem oini, which again translates as the, 
you know, bread of distress, of affliction, or literally of poverty. That means it has to be poor man's bread, which is just flour and water. There's no sophistication. There's no character to it. That the matzah has to be specifically lechem oini. Otherwise, you don't do the mitzah. Now, since, by contrast, in the matzahs which are mentioned in regards to the eating of the matzah prior to their leaving Egypt, it does not mention lechem oini. We can come to a conclusion that then, while they were still in Mitzrayim, they were allowed to eat matzah ashira. They were allowed to eat, and in other words, they, in other words, they could have fulfilled their obligation of eating matzah on that night, even with eating matzah ashira, eating eating matzah that has some juice in it or eggs or whatever it may be. It's just that after leaving Egypt then we're forbidden to consume such type of matzah in order to fulfill the mitzvah. Now, the Pesach, meaning the observance of the Seder, the eating of the matzah that took place in Mitzrayim, this is the source, this is the root of all the Pesachs, of all the consumption of matzah of all future generations. And therefore, it must lead to a conclusion, must lead us to understand that in some way, in some way, although the halach it's not so, but in some way, this aspect, this idea of matzah ashira also playing a role <clears throat> that it has to have some connection to the <clears throat> matzah of all future generations. Where do we find any such type of connection? So the Rebbe brings a very interesting Mordechai. The Mordechai is one of the commentaries, one of the primary commentaries on the Talmud. And he gives the following description. He says that in the times of the Beis HaMikdosh, when they had the carbon Pesach, what they would do is they would first eat the Yom Tif meal. In other words, they would first have an entire meal, fill themselves up with the regular Yom Tif meal. Only afterwards would they now, um, uh, would they now uh, commence to observe the mitzvah of eating matzah and then the carbon Pesach. Now, when you know, when you have a meal on Yom Tif, you have to wash, you have to make hamoitzi. So how would they do so? So he explains that they would eat matzah ashira in order not to eat the matzah with which they're later going to fulfill the mitzvah. In other words, they ate first their meal, they ate matzah, what matzah did they eat? Matzah with which you cannot perform the mitzvah, and only afterwards, after they finished the meal, did they eat the matzah of the mitzvah, and then later... Uh, continue with the carbon Pesach. That's how he describes it. And likewise, we find that very, an interesting idea, similar to this, is that halachically, it's brought down in halacha, that an Arab Pesach, one is allowed to eat matzah ashira. One is allowed to eat egg matzah on the eve of Pesach, because with egg matzah you cannot fulfill the mitzvah. So now, to put this whole thing in perspective, but we look at it, look at it this way. In the commandment of Lechem Oini, in the, when it comes to why we have to eat Lechem Oini, why the matzah that we eat today to perform the mitzvah could only be Lechem Oini, the Torah tells us, Because <laughs> you left Egypt in haste, meaning you didn't have time to allow it to become leavened, you didn't have time for it allow it to rise, and therefore, you have to eat Lechem Oini. Question. How does this become the reason why we have to eat Lechem In other words, how does the fact that we left Egypt in haste become a reason why the matzah we eat has to be has to be void of any characteristic, has to be void of any taste, has to be void of anything other than just plain simple water? Now, if you look at the same pasuk where it says Leisoychal olav chametz, you should not eat on it chametz. Seven days you should eat matzahs, which although it doesn't mention that it has to be lechem oini, this is we're talking about now the matzah before they left Mitzrayim, right? In the original commandment in Parsha's boy, still we learn from it something which does apply to, even to our matzahs today, and that is that the in order that 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 the matzah has to be made from such a type of dough. In other words, the matzah with which we do the mitzvah has to come from such a source that potentially could have become chametz. 
Notice what the Pasuk says. The Pasuk makes a correlation between you should not eat any chametz on it, but you should eat matzah. So we understand that the matzah has to be made from such a dough, has to come from such a source, that had you not been careful about it, then it would have been, quote, So from this it comes out that there's two things. There's a connection. Matzah ashira which of course is not valid for us today, matzah ashir with which we cannot do the mitzvah, there's a direct correlation also to the type of dough which cannot become chametz. They go hand in hand. However, if you go back to the original Pesach, that is the first one which we're discussing, where they did have matzah ashira, that matzah had to be made from dough that cannot, that was potentially able to become chametz. In other words, as the Torah says, Ushmar Temes You have to safeguard the matzahs. Why would you have to safeguard it if it didn't have the potential to become chametz? So in other words, they were allowed to make, have matzah ashira. They were allowed to eat matzah which has some character to it. However, it had to still be a dough which potentially could have become chametz had it not been safeguarded. How can that be? We explained already in the introduction. When you mix part water, part fruit juice, part water, part wine, part water, part oil, so then, or part eggs, that is now a matzah ashira, but it still has the quality, it still has the criteria of the fact that it is, quote, a dough which is potential potentially able to become chametz, but just by your means of not allowing it to become chametz, they did not become chametz. So how do we explain all this? I mean, it seems to be a contrast. On the one hand, you're allowed to have matzah shira before you leave Egypt. In the other hand, it still had to be made out of quote-unquote dough, which is suitable for matzah. Then versus the matzah that we eat now, which can absolutely not be in any way for matzah shira and has to be lechem oini because they left in haste. What's going on over here? What is this all about? So the Rebbe says, we'll explain it esoterically in avoida. We'll approach this from the means of understanding it through the lens of avoida, of the service, one service to Hashem. The difference between the expression of lechem oini versus matzah ashira. Lechem oini represents, as we said, it's made out of plain, simple flour and water. It has no flavor, no tam. That is a symbol of Kabbalah's oil. What's Kabbalah's oil? Kabbalah's oil means you have no explanation in your mind, you have no understanding, you have no appreciation of it, but you do it because that's what has to be done. That is the right thing that has that, that, to do. And you do it. You force yourself to do it. You obligate yourself to do it. You get it done. You like it, you don't like it, you do it. That's lechem oini. Matzah ashira, which already is flour with something of taste. Well, like I said, wine, oil, honey, whatever it may be, that represents the avoidas Hashem, where one approaches it, as we say, mitzatam vodas. One has, quote, a gishmak in it. One has an appreciation of it. One understands, one accepts, one feels like doing it. What is the difference between the two? In other words, which one is greater? Which, what, what, how does this express itself? When a Yid serves Hashem exclusively or merely because of Kabbalah's oil, what does that mean? That from his own personal understanding, from his own personal feelings, he maybe is um, open to or prone to go against Hashem's will or not to fulfill the particular mitzvah. However, he overrides that, he suppresses that, by, by forcing himself not to do what he feels like doing, not to do what he understands he wants to do, but doing what he is told or what he convinces himself that this is what Hashem wants him to do. However, when one does some, does, serves Hashem because of Tam Vadas, meaning he has an appreciation in it, what does that mean? That the person becomes as if ishapcha, like he's transformed. He is totally devoted to it because he understands, he appreciates, he feels like doing what Hashem wants him to do. He, there's no place, there's no room, there's no possibility, there's no potential at all for him going against Hashem's will. And now we can see 
we can appreciate the, 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 the connection between what we said before, that it seems to go hand in hand. Matzah Ashira goes hand in hand with, quote, something that cannot come to become chametz, can never potentially become chametz, because they're connected. What does chametz represent? Chametz represents that it gets sour, it gets spoiled, it goes against Hashem's will. Well, if it's Matzah Ashira, the person has an understanding, the person has an appreciation, the person is 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 dispo- predisposed to do what Hashem wants, then there is no room for going against Hashem's will. There is no possibility, quote, of becoming chametz whatsoever. It's only by lechem oini, which is plain, simple flour and water. There is no sophistication, so to speak. There is no excitement on the person's part. The person is not transformed. The person has a susceptibility to going against Hashem's will, and that which they need to suppress. There, there is, quote, a possibility, a potential of becoming a chametz. Now, if we would stop here, it would seem then that matzah ashira is greater than lechem oini. However, says the Rebbe, in general terms, these two modes of avoida they get expressed in general if you look at the contrast, the difference between Yitzias Mitzrayim, the geula, the redemption from Mitzrayim, and the ultimate geula, the geula that will come through Mashiach. By Yitzias Mitzrayim, what is the description? How does it say in Parshas Bishalach? Kivarach ha'om, for the people escaped. They had to run away. Like the Altareb explains in Tanya that since the Ra, Shebenafshe Yisrael, Adayin Hoye Betokvoy, the, the bad element that was in the souls of the Jews was still in its full power and its full force, so they had no choice, they had to run away. This is Iskafia. But when it comes to the Geula HaSida, when it comes to the Geula by Mashiach, what does it say in Yeshayo? The Prophet tells us, You're not going to go in haste, because there's not going to be a reason to run. Why? As it says in the Prophet Zechariah, Hashem will eradicate all impurity, all negativity, all evil from the land. Meaning there will be no bad. There will be no susceptibility for bad. And therefore there will be no reason to run. This is his hapcha. Now we can understand why on the night of Pesach we need to eat dafka lechem oini. Specifically lechem oini. Why? Because bechipazan yatsasa. Remember we asked what kind of reason it is. Because we left in haste. The bad... The evil is still in its full force. There is still room, chas v'shalem, for slipping. There is still the susceptibility, some possibility of somebody slipping and doing that which is not good, doing bad in the eyes of Hashem. And therefore, we, we require Kabbalah soil. But now back to the contrast between Kabbalah soil and Lechem Oini, which is the same as Matzah Ashira versus um, um, I'm sorry, Kabbalah Soy Lechem Oini versus Matzah Ashira, which is Avoida Pitam Vadas, the question remains, which is greater? In other words, which, which, is, which is far better than the other? It would seem, again, as we said before, the Avoida that's a Pitam Vadas, because this is total transformation, total Ishapcha. Ha? Huh? Says the Rebbe, no. The answer is that true Ishapcha is a tremendous accomplishment where the bad becomes totally nullified, there is no bad, and now there's only good. However, there's a great, tremendous advantage and a tremendous service of Hashem in the avoid of Iskafia, or as we know it in this, in this discussion, the avoid of Lechem Oini. Why? Because in this mode of avoid, the person is putting in their effort. They're actively toiling, they're actively working and serving Hashem. It's not something which is just happening on its own. It's not just something which is happening, so to speak, you know, by, by, by default, because there's no bad anymore in the person. The person actively serves Hashem. He is constantly fighting against his bad. Or to put it in other words, in, in, in a slightly different style, by his habcha, it's the person who becomes one with Hashem. Their mind, their emotions, their desires become one with Hashem. But the person is there. It's he now, so to speak, thinks like Hashem. He now thinks in line with what Hashem wants. Versus when a person is is serving Hashem out of his skafia, 
what it happens here is you have the element of bitul. The person has to cancel himself out. The person has to void his own feelings. The person has to suppress his own desires. There you have bitul, which you do not have once you've reached the level of Ishaqa. And this is the reason, says the Rebbe, interestingly, and we say it in the Haggadah, well, even after Mashiach comes, we're going to mention Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim. The question is, after Mashiach comes, we're going to have a total transformation. Total Ishaqa, there won't be any more bad. Why would we mention Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim? The answer is because then we're going to need, we're going to desire and, and, and look for to have this great advantage, this great Mila of Iskafia, which won't be readily available, won't be naturally available on its own, will have to remind ourselves of Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim and generate within ourselves the concept of Kabbalah's oil of Beto. And now we have it the other way around too. That even in, also in Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim, we had some inclusiveness in it of this aspect of what's going to be in the Geula Hasidah, meaning this idea of his hapcha, and that and and this is what the Alter Rebbe explains why, in reference to the Geula of Mitzrayim, Hashem uses the, the Hashem says the Anoichi Al Chogam Oloi. I will I will Al I will bring you up. Gam Oloi, I'll also bring you up. That he was referring to both Geulois. He was referring to the Geulis Mitzrayim. And coupled with it, he was also referring to the ultimate Geula. What is the explanation of this? That in order to be better motivated in his kafya, it helps when one knows that it ultimately will lead to his habcha. In other words, when you go out of Mitzrayim, and you know, even though right now you're employing Iskafia, but you know that ultimately there will be an Ishaqa, there will be a total transformation. Ultimately, there will be the ultimate Geula. That gives you drive. That gives you courage. And that's why before they left Mitzrayim, there was a mention of the second Geula. Now, the idea of it is not just to have, a, so to speak, a remote awareness that it will be in the future, as we just explained. But rather, the Rebbe adds that it also it's incorporated, the idea of Ishapcha becomes incorporated into Ishkafia. How do you do that? In other words, how before they left Mitzrayim, when they, ha- when they were leaving Mitzrayim, when they had to engage in a manner of Ishkafia, how did, did it help them to know about this Ishapcha aspect? What did it do? So the Rebbe says, this basically means that even though one is going against their own will, one is forcing themselves to do it, but in other words, one is forcing themselves to behave, to serve Hashem in a manner of, his, of Kabbalah soil, of Iskafia. But when you have the aspect of Ishapcha, means that you add, you put in some excitement to it, some joy into it. You don't do it reluctantly, but you're doing it willingly. You're doing it as if it was Ishapcha. That, that, and this gets expressed by, again, infusing the idea of the Geula HaAsida, of the ultimate Geula, into the Geulah's Mitzrayim, by coupling them together, this brings the excitement into the Kabbalah's oil of Yitzhiyah's Mitzrayim. And now we can understand, we can appreciate, why even by going, by going out of Mitzrayim, they were allowed to have Matzah Ashira. They were allowed to have this Matzah, which, which typically represents the Ishaqa aspect, the aspect of enjoyment, of pleasure, of appreciation, because they needed to but but at the same time it had to have it had to be made from a dough which cannot which which could potentially become chametz. In other words, that that indicates that the bad was still there. They had to force themselves not to allow it to become bad. They had to force themselves not allow it to become chametz, which is symbolic of bad. But at the same time, they had to inject into it a gishmak, a pleasure and appreciation for what they're doing, and so to speak, enjoy it. This all was only then, before they left Mitzrayim. However, after we left Mitzrayim, we need to exclusively have Lechem Oini. Why? Why exclusively Lechem Oini, which represents the idea of pure Kabbalah's oil, pure Iskafia? Why? So the Rebbe explains, because once we've left Mitzrayim, we are no longer, we ceased being of the Pari, servants of Pari. Now we are exclusively servants of Hashem. And therefore, it is forbidden in any whatsoever way 
for the person to have, so to speak, his own personality, his own desires, his own will, his own metzias, his own existence, somehow mixed into it. It has to be exclusively the idea of what Hashem's will is. It has to be exclusively Kabbalah's oil, and which represents total and absolute bitul. And that's why, after once we've left Mitzrayim, Matzah Ashira is forbidden, and the only way to perform the mitzvah, which is symbolic of the only way to really truly serve Hashem properly today, is through Kabbalah's oil.